Hello you, it's me. Today we're going to talk about Alex E. Harrow's The Once and Future Witches. I had really high expectations of this book going into it because of how much I loved their debut novel, The Ten Thousand Doors of January. And I know it's always dangerous going into a book with such high expectations, but I was not disappointed at all. This was incredible. Easily in the top ten fantasy books I've read ever, um... Probably the best alternate history I've ever read. So I'll go through everything I loved about this book. I'm not going to include a, what I didn't like about this book. Because honestly, I can't find fault with it. And that's rare. But honestly, I cannot. Oh, oh. So unless I think of something while I'm doing this, this is literally just going to be a gush review about how great this book is. The book made a lot of references to, um, and I had to look a lot of things up while I was reading it. So interesting stuff. I learned. I'll chuck that in as well, I guess. The book is set in a world where witchcraft exists. Magic is real. It's set in 1893, at the end of the 19th century, in a city called New Salem, which was established after Old Salem was burned to the ground by witch hunters. Women who work powerful magic or are capable of witching are considered extremely dangerous and in most societies have been persecuted and eradicated. The old and powerful witches are gone. Nothing remains of them but myth and story. And all that remains of magic now are little spells handed down through families, uh, used for housework or entertainment, frowned upon but not outright illegal. But the book paints a picture of a world where different societies look upon witching very differently. But the ability to work magic using the will, the words and the way comes naturally to almost all women. The book opens following James Juniper Eastwood, the youngest of three sisters who are the daughters and granddaughters of witches, and she's fleeing from Crow Country to New Salem after murdering her father with magic. Her sisters, two sisters, are left home separately than her years before, and unbeknownst to each other, have been living pretty nearby uh, in New Salem. Agnes Amaranth Eastwood, who is a mill worker, and Beatrice Belladonna Eastwood, who is an assistant librarian. As soon as Juniper arrives in town, she smells magic on the air, and to the panic of the crowds, a portal is opened in the town square. For a split second, beyond which lies a strange sky and a rose-choked black tower. It's Avalon, the once home of the now-dead three most powerful witches, the Maiden, the Mother, and the Crone. Filled with anger at the world in which power and respect have been stolen from women, Juniper, wanted for murder and with posters of her face pasted all around the town, decides to join the suffragette movement in New Salem, who are campaigning very gently to get votes for women. And she soon realises that that's not enough, and it's never going to be enough. Why should women not be entitled to use their abilities? To weave spells handed down to them by their mother, and their mother's mother. Men out of fear have led campaigns to choke women into subservience that witches rise to fight against. They burned spell books along with the witches for centuries in an attempt to eradicate magic from the face of the earth. In New Salem itself, a new candidate for mayor promises the public an end to sin and the persecution of witches, a new inquisition. But magic isn't that easy to kill, and the librarian sister Beatrice discovers that all the old witch stories and fairy tales written by women for centuries contain clues, spells, hints of lines of song, the key to magic. So the three sisters resolve to discover the way back to Avalon, to flood the world with magic again, and to start a glorious new age of witchcraft and empowerment. So this is really a story of women's fight uh, for what was stolen from them by a male-centric society. And it's used magic to add another factor to the fight. So there's more to gain if the good guys win, more to lose if the good guys lose. And in proportion to this, the threat has escalated too, with the use of magic twisted to evil ends and used against itself. So in this society, you have women fighting for the right to vote, for fair treatment in terms of labour, the fight to reclaim the magic that is their ancestral heritage and the power that would bring. And you have the racial tension in New Salem, which is very closely tied into women's rights and magic. Everything is very closely interwoven in this book, and it's all dressed really, really well. Firstly, as was the case with 10,000 Doors of January, Harrow's writing style is just hauntingly beautiful. 
They construct scenes not just with visual description, but with textures, tastes, and smells in such a way that this is one of the most immersive books I've read for a long time. The picture the book helps you build of the places it describes are incredible, and this would probably be quite easy to adapt into another medium because of the attention to detail. Several times through the book I was reading and just had my hair stand on end and was brought close to tears just by beautiful sentences, gorgeous word choices. Really, really, this is poetry. Every line and nothing is trivial. The characters were amazing. There wasn't a single character I didn't like. I even thought the villain was so well done. The motivation and their backstory when you find it out and how they're tied into the attempt to eradicate witches is just like, what? But the sisters, the characters they surround themselves with are so realistic, believable, and in a way that's really hard to do, they really act and interact like sisters. And I know this because I have four little sisters. I love how the classic witch theme of Maiden, Mother and Crone was represented within the sister trio, with them all fulfilling their roles, as well as completely subverting them. The youngest sister, the Maiden, as well as being adventurous and passionate, is scarred, damaged and walks with a cane. The middle sister, the mother, instead of being a lover and seductive temptress, is a protective warrior who's dealing with problems that were caused by men she thought she loved. The crone, rightly, is wise and bookish, the cleverest of the three. But unlike the wise old wrinkly woman of myth, she's tall and beautiful, yet riddled with self-doubt, unconfident, and thinks herself a coward. It leads me on to my first sort of tangent, which is the whole idea of the trilogy trinity of witches, the triple goddess idea of maiden, mother, and crone, representing the stages in the life of a woman, closely tied to the phases of the moon, with the new moon, the full moon, and the waning moon. I looked up the origin of the, the trinity goddess thing and found it's, sorry, I'm reading my notes because I looked it up and I wrote some stuff down, found out it's Hecate, 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 uh, represented in three aspects, was the first recorded. Uh, the Huntress, uh, the Moon, and the Ruler of the Underworld. But the Fates, also known as Moirai, or the Weird Sisters, the controllers of destiny in Greek myth, are also a trinity, represented as a young, a middle-aged, and an old woman. Shakespeare reuses these characters in Macbeth, but cites his inspiration uh, as the Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland, published 50 years before, in 1587, in which the future King of Scotland meets, and I quote, Three women in strange and wild apparel, resembling creatures of the Elder World. I'm guessing that the three witch trope is part triple goddess pagan carryover and part mockery of the church holy trinity. Three is an important number in folklore anyway. Three bears, three billy goats gruff. I don't know much about numerology, so if you know more about this and you can teach me, drop it down in the comments. I would love to know. Uh, yeah, leave a comment and tell me why there are always three witches. What's that about? The use of the trinities in this story is recurring throughout and it's so good. You have the triple conflict in the city, rights, magic and race. Triple tragedies that befall the sisters. The triple requirements for a spell. The sisters themselves. It really is a theme that ties the book together and gives it overall a much more fairy tale feel than it would otherwise have. When I read fantasy books I do judge them a lot on how good the magic system is. And I think the key to how charming Harrow's was is how simple it is. You need words, you need intent, you need ingredients. The ingredients are deliberate, they're relevant to the spells. The will is really reinforced when they talk about the idea that behind each witch is a woman wronged, and magic is the step between wanting something and having it. The fact that to avoid the eradication of magic, women hid the words and instructions in poems, in songs, in stories, they're told their daughters to keep it alive. This means that most of the words of the spells in the book, at least the spells which are in English, are very familiar and are the warped lines of nursery rhymes that we all know. E.g. Buy baby bunting, mother's gone a-hunting. A spell to end what hasn't yet begun, requiring penny royal and regret. May she snatch me through the doors of hell and take me down with her to dwell. A spell for opening certain doors requiring stars and scars. Tangent number two. While I was looking up um, some of the nursery rhymes in this book that I didn't recognise, I found something amazing called the Raud Folk Song Index, which is a catalogue of over 250,000 folk songs uh, in the English language. 
and every known variant of these songs and poems. How bonkers is that? The full catalogue is available on the Vaughan's, uh, Vaughan Williams Memorial Library website, and I'd highly recommend having a look because it's really interesting. And if you like folklore, it's definitely up your alley. Tangent number three, when I was reading this, I actually recognised one of the poems from uh, Neil Gaiman's Stardust. Three score miles and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? There and back again. Yes, if your feet are nimble and light, you can get there by candlelight. And I found out that that's actually an old poem. I thought it had been written specifically for Stardust and was about the black flame, black flame candles, but it's an older thing. It's a folklore thing. So very interesting. Tangent number four. One of the spells quotes what appeared to be the lyrics of House of the Rising Sun by the animals which I didn't know was a cover, and apparently dates back as early as 1905, and is a supposedly a corruption, bastardization of a much older song brought to America by French immigrants, and is about the reign of Louis XIV, and the meaning has just been warped. You learn new things every day. Also in terms of the magic system, and something I was not expecting at all, male magic exists in this world. Female magic is referred to as witching, and male magic is just called man magic. We have a few examples of spells uh, from the system of man magic in the book. And for quite a long time, I was trying to figure out exactly what the difference is between the two. Besides the male magic being in Latin and handed down as spoken word rather than having to hide in poetry and song. And I realised what the whole thing was about. It's just a metaphor for social convention and stereotype. These two things are literally the same. They're both magic. But society has said, men can do X, women can do Y. Don't do the other thing. That's horrid. Ridiculous and silly. There's a great interaction in the story where Agnes goes to see a railway worker who's responsible for some sabotage to learn a spell for causing rust. And he tells her she won't be able to work it because men and women are built differently. Men can't work women's magic and women can't work men's magic. And she asks him, have you tried? And he's he's like, no, why would I? So I thought the gendered magic inclusion uh, as a metaphor for that stupidness was really clever. I will also talk about the inclusivity of the book, which was fantastic. Obviously, you have the white and the non-white characters written so well and realistically. Their magic systems are culturally very different. And the way that society treats people for being black as well as witches is very realistically written. Also, with the idea I just spoke about of gendered magic, I thought going into it that one of my criticisms of the book would be its failure to tackle uh, trans characters in regards to magic being so woman-centric. But it does, and it does it so gracefully that it was something I really appreciated reading. Also, there are LGBTQ plus characters in this book who are not just background characters, real humans who are integral to the story and the way society at the time would have reacted to this, and the prejudices they would have faced, and it was all written very realistically and very well. Every character in here was full and believable. The story was just an incredible ride from start to finish. There were no boring moments in the whole book. There were twists and turns, and the way the plot was playing out was just riveting the whole way through. And the conclusion was so satisfying. There was tragedy heaped in this book but also hope and power and characters that made you go, yeah, yes. And there were bits that were funny and having those jewels in the book and how attached that made me to characters made the sad bits even sadder. I love this book so much. Harrow is setting a really high bar for fantasy in my mind. And I would love to recommend their other book too, 10,000 Doors of January. It's really worth your time. They've done two books so far. Both books have been masterclass. And I really think Harrow now is one of my auto-buy authors. I'll probably just pick up anything with their name on it. I bought this one without even reading the blurb, just because of the author. So put this book in your eyes. You will not regret it. Five stars, 10 out of 10. Cannot wait for the next book that they come out with. Um, Yeah, amazing. Oh, I'm not going to be over this book for a while. So that's it. Uh, Thank you very much for watching me gush about this fantastic book. If you've read it, it's quite a new book. I've only got the paperback because I got an advanced copy. Um, If you've read it, let me know what you thought. Uh, If you want to read it, let me know down below that you're adding it to your TBR, what you're reading at the moment. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Give me your opinion about why witches always come in threes. I'm very interested to hear what you've got to say. Thanks for watching.
Um, that's it. Like and subscribe down below. Content warnings down below as well. Follow me on Twitter, which is also down below. That's it. Um, thank you very much. I'll see you soon. Bye.